Welcome back, Lizzie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. In the final episode of this series, um, what I'd like to talk to you about is gut testing. So in the conventional NHS, we just do a stool test for overcysts and parasites, um, and we may do some fit testing. Um, but we're aware that the functional world has some very detailed testing, and our gastroenterology colleagues don't tend to venture into this world. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to ask you is, what are the top three tests that you would recommend when someone comes in with uh, gut problems? Um, and secondly, why are the conventional doctors not looking in this direction when we've established that all our gut health is poor and it can lead to a whole array of symptoms later? Mm. Top three tests. Um, I think the first one isn't a test, it's simply a history um, and making it a very good one. Yeah. So give the patient the time to talk. Um, it's really important to understand their history, how the gut could have been affected along the way. You know, it can be something banal like uh, stress when she was 16 because she was sitting an exam, for example. It all matters. Um, so that would be one, not a test, but an important start. Um, and then ultimately, yes, you're right, comprehensive stool analysis. It digs way deeper than your average um, stool testing. It looks at all the good bacteria, the potentially the bad bacteria, the overgrowth, the funguses, the yeast, the things that do cause problems. Yes, it also includes parasites, etc. Um, so that's really important and it shows us digestive breakdown and how we're using our food really. Um, so that would be my second. Um, the last one, I think, with gut problems, there is definitely value in food allergy testing. It gives a really good insight into the gut and the how the body is responding and the wall and the leaky gut concept um, and things that we can eliminate yeah. in the early days to really kickstart that healing. Okay, great. So why aren't our colleagues doing all of these tests in hospital? Normally they get a colonoscopy and a biopsy and a, a blood test to exclude um, celiac disease. And then they're told if all that is normal, they've got irritable bowel, eat more fibre, eat more fruit. Good why question. Are doing this sort of testing? Look, I mean, there's a limit to what you can do in the public health service. Of course there is. Um, but this type of testing holds a lot of value if you want to get to the root cause. Why isn't everyone doing it? We just don't have the capacity. Mm. Um, and it's expensive. It is, it, but, you know, as I said, one of my top tests is just the history. And so that is a starting point for people who don't want to go down that route of more expensive testing. So. It's interesting, we perhaps need to map out the cost of a colonoscopy versus a functional gut test. Absolutely, it's a mindset. It's, it's yes. changing someone's mindset yes. um, and the clinician's mindset, yes. which is equally tricky. Yes. <laughs> so the other thing I wanted to ask you is now we've established, we talked about dysbiosis, we talked about SIBO, we talked about leaky gut syndrome, and we talked a little bit about the things that cause all of these things. And it feels like there's almost a standard protocol that could be out there to cover all of these things because it feels like there's some element of all of those that exist. So if you were to give advice as a generic um, uh, generic advice for good gut health, what would be the three or four things that you would tell patients to do? So ultimately we need to establish if there is an overgrowth, a dysbiotic picture. If there is, we want to remove it whether that be antibiotics or natural way. That's really important. So once we've removed it, we want to essentially restore it. And in doing that, we, as you said, we use collagen, we use anti-inflammatory methods, be it supplements, um, etc. And then we want to repopulate it in that instance. So we're using the pre, the pro, the postbiotics. We're working on your diet and your lifestyle. Um, and then we want to essentially restore it. So whether that's peptide treatment ongoing um, over a longer period of time to help you not get back to the place you started, cool. it's really important. Yeah. So That sounds so simple and so logical. And it is, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing that we didn't touch on, but um, should everyone take digestive enzymes um, or is that overkill? Um, no really is the answer not everyone should have to do it potentially you might need it and there's a role for it um, because digestion is definitely impaired by our sort of day-to-day -day 21st century life yeah so potentially yes in the first instance yes people can should they need to and will they have to for for a lifelong period absolutely not no. it's just about yeah. restoring function yeah 
So again, this dual test that you described will give us an indication of how much emphasis to put on all of these things. Yeah, it literally breaks it down. So it yeah. breaks down your ability to digest proteins, fats, etc. It looks at your microbiome. Is it imbalanced? Is there dysbiosis? It looks at your ability to create your own good bacteria, feed back into it. So it breaks it down really nicely and it allows us a platform to start treating from. Fantastic. Well, from the first series, we established how the gut is so powerful in almost every systemic disease. I almost wonder whether there's a case for everyone to have one of these tests done, to know where they sit early on in their lives, which can then help change behavior and potentially stop illness. I agree. I mean, ultimately, we know that we think and we know that to a certain extent, leaky gut leads to autoimmune disease. As you say, some clinicians are adamant that's an apparent diagnosis. Um, and we know in animal trials that once we kind of cut the actual connection between the gut and the external body through the vagus nerve, that the disease disappears, be it ALS, dementia, Alzheimer's, all likely consequences of inflammation stemming from the gut, Interesting. as far as we're aware yes. so far. So you've made reference to the vagus nerve. Is that the pathway connection between the brain and gut axis. Yes, it so literally that, connects that's the, the That's the lane. That the highway. That's the highway. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. So, and interestingly, more signals go from gut to brain than from brain to gut. So they get formed from the same essentially piece of material at birth, embryology, the development. They just get formed from the same piece of body. Um, they evolve uh, and they signal they talk to each other all day. Goodness. Mm. And that's why they call the gut the second brain. Exactly. Fascinating. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the on Thank the you series. So and um, lots to think about. But the nice thing is the message is very simple. Um, and it's something that can literally benefit everybody. Yeah. Good. Definitely hope. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>